in my museum of things you would expect to find in the Torah, but do not. It's one of my favorite museums. It is, yeah. and you can have a family membership. Liz, Liz has a family membership, which includes a behind the scenes tour <laughs> and 15% off at the gift shop. Um, What's at the gift shop? <laughs> there's all sorts of things having to do with what things you would expect to find, to find in the Torah, but do not. Um, so one of, so uh, one of the things that you would expect to find in the Torah, but do not, is an explanation of what angels are. Angels show up. They show up almost right at the beginning with cherubs protecting the tree of life. And uh, there are angels that are visiting Avraham and Sarah. There's angels that are destroying Sodom. Um, so we have, there's, uh, Yaakov refers to an angel, Hamalach HaGoel Osimi Ra, the angel that saves me or redeems me from every, everything bad. May he bless these boys. Uh, so there's references to angels and it continues in the, in the book of Shmos, there's discussion of angels and, you know, and in the, in this Torah portion in the Torah portion of, of Balak in the story of Bilam, there's an angel with, uh, a donkey. Elam's riding his donkey, and the donkey sees the angel, won't go forward. <clears throat> so if you study mystical texts, you will find all manner of discussion about angels, the names of angels, you might even be given techniques that require speaking to angels. I once had a friend. I still have this friend, but he moved. So <laughs> we don't talk a lot, but he's, he's, uh, 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 he was a good friend. I feel that way about him to this day. His name is Rabbi Shane Garden. So uh, there was a period of time where I was teaching classes on Jewish meditation and he came and did like a guest spot. He's a fascinating guy. He's a Ger Hasid. He's a Hasidic guy. And doesn't seem to come from a milieu that would make him comfortable with the kind of people that might come to a Jewish meditation class. But he fit right in. And he, he was just uh, one of these people, very likable guy who fit in in all society, all aspects of society. So, and uh, so he had come and would sometimes speak to my Jewish meditation classes. And so I knew he knew, you know, some heebie jeebie stuff uh, <laughs> through that. And, uh, but one time we were at uh, Shalash Shudas, we davened at the same Hasidic Shtiba when I lived in West Rogers Park. And uh, so at Shalash Shudas time, he once came over to me and says, you want to learn how to talk to angels? And uh, so I said, I, I, I don't think I'm ready uh, for that. <laughs> and so I passed up on the opportunity. When and that, therefore, up until this Rogers, day. When did you live in West Rogers Park? I lived there from about 95 to 2000. I also went to high school there. So I also lived there from about 74 to 78. What high school did you go to? Yeshivas Brisk of Chicago. Did you know anybody who went to Yeshiva's Brisk of Chicago? I was there. Uh, and it was in West Rogers Park for several years. And then it eventually moved to Skokie. Then when we went back to West Rogers Park. Anyways, so he he asked me if I wanted to learn how to speak to angels. I passed I up on that opportunity. I would have said yes. Would you? Yeah. I don't know. It, it sounded like it was, it was going somewhere deep. Uh, by the way, that Rabbi Shane Garten, is a hugely important uh, person in my life because uh, years later, 
he had already moved to Lakewood, Lakewood, New Jersey. He had left left Quite Chicago. Familiar. So um, this isn't an exactly an angel story. It's more of a it's a Dybbuk story. Now Dybbuk's oh, no. are not angels. No. Dybbuk's are supposed to be. They're supposed to be a soul that is occupying another body. It's not supposed to be in that body, and it's in that body. That's what a dipic is supposed to be. But what happened was, I was writing. This is when blogs were first starting, when they when it first became possible for the average human being to write a blog, but they were still just sort of happening. And there was a, a, a Jewish blogosphere where people were sort of gravitating towards Jewish blogs. And there was, you, you sort of went from one blog to another to another because your blog, you'd, you'd link people to other blogs that, that you knew. So the way you found the new blogs is you'd go to somebody's blog, you'd look at the stuff that he was linked to, and then you'd go to his. Anyway, so this is right at the beginning of them. And I, I had like a more serious blog um, that was just an opportunity to post a little something uh, of my own thoughts. And then I had a couple humorous blogs because I figured they would be good writing practice. I had one blog that was, it was the, it was the Kabbalah Discount Center. Because <laughs> my, my feeling was that the Kabbalah Center was attracting a lot of Gentiles because of the way it was marketing itself. I wanted a Kabbalah center that would only be Did you call it the for Kabbalah Jews. Kabbalah discount center? Yes, no. I'll tell you why. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> I figured I if I call it the Kabbalah discount center, only Jews will come to it. <laughs> that the reason the Kabbalah center was attracting Gentiles is that everything was retail. It is so expensive. And expensive. <laughs> and therefore it's, Jews are not going there. But if you have a Kabbalah discount center, <laughs> then it will attract Jews. And, and part of the way it could be a Kabbalah discount center is it would off. So one of the things it had, it had nearly red strings. They weren't actually red. <laughs> they, were, they were nearly red. reddish. They were reddish. <laughs> and uh, and it didn't have Kabbalah water, but it had Kabbalah bourbon. And after like four or five shots of it, you did not know the difference. <laughs> and it had it was all that. It didn't go far. I didn't. Uh, it didn't go far. But that was my Kabbalah discount center. Anyways, one of my humorous <laughs> attempts was called the Orthodox Jewish Exorcist, and it was the adventures of this guy. It was a fictional thing. It was the adventures of this guy who uh, it was a noir, like a noir detective. Mm -hmm. He was in Northbrook. He had office by the Northbrook Inn. You know that Northbrook, like um, on Shermer, there's that, that kind of inn across from Graders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That little oh, restaurant yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, 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 restaurant, yeah. whatever. So that's where he hung out. And there was a guy named Rusty that was a barman behind the thing. And this is your idea. This was my, but he had, yeah. I wrote, I wrote a bunch of like, I wrote a bunch of little entries for it. So he would go, he would be like a noir detective. He had one of those kind of offices. He had a secretary um, who had a very kind of German personality. And, um, and, but he would get cases, you know, people would call him about, possessions and he'd go out uh and he'd have to solve them and there was always some kind of hu you know humorous something that went along with it so i get a call around this time i get a call it's a voicemail from uh long island it's a woman who said she needs a jewish exorcist and she saw she looked online oh there was one other thing i did <laughs> In Wikipedia, under exorcism, oh, I put in the references a link to my blog. So it was list like in the like external references or whatever. There just happened to be a link there, and it just stayed there. Nobody cared. It was in the just the exorcism thing. 
So anyways, I get a call from a woman from Long Island that uh, that she is um, she needs a a Jewish exorcist and uh, she's she sees that I'm a Jewish exorcist. So I thought this was a joke, you know, like one of my friends was <laughs> joking with me when they left this thing. But I looked up the phone number and it really was in Long Island. I looked up the name and there were real people like that living in in Long Island. And so I I called her. And she told me that she told me the story, which was that she has a son who is autistic and has been having uncharacteristic experiences that include violent behavior, et cetera, but not what is typical for, for that kind of uh, circumstance. It, it was uncharacteristic and different. And so uh, she sought out uh, her some spiritual friends. She even had an exorcism from, I think she had two different exorcisms from Christian pastors that do exorcisms. And it would work for a little bit, but then it would come back. And then finally, a medium told her that her son is possessed by a Jewish demon. Those were the words, a Jewish demon demon like the woman herself jewish the woman is jewish and the her son is jewish her husband's jewish and the the medium the told medium her the son is possessed by a jewish demon is this something i could handle that's what she asked me so i explained to her that that i'm assuming that you heard about me because of that blog and it's a, it's just a humorous exercise i am i am not myself an exorcist but i hear that sh she is in trouble and i i want to try to help not as an exorcist but i want to try to help so i'm gonna try to uh, contact some people and see what i can do to help you so i call rabbi shane garden my angel guy <laughs> so um I leave him this message. By this time, Tippy and I are in a place called Laconner, Wisconsin. And it's Thanksgiving. And we're at this inn, which is completely empty. And it, it's just us. And it's getting to that time, you know, the sunsetty kind of time. So it's like a weird feel on a time when nobody's around in an inn along the ocean in Washington. And I get a call back from Rabbi Shane Garten. And Rabbi Shane Garten says, just to show you how important this phone call is, I am in the middle of sitting Shiva for my mother. Like, wow. And I'm still calling you to tell you to stay away from this, to get a million miles away from this. This is so much bigger than you. This is so much, it is so dangerous. Do not go near this. And I, who am an idiot, I, for some reason, I was totally intimidated <laughs> about talking to angels. But now I'm like a complete idiot. So I just, even though he just said all of that, I'm like arguing with him, like I would know. And, I, and I'm saying, but certainly Hashem wouldn't send an illness for which there is no healing. And he said, what about cancer? What about, he starts listing all sorts of illnesses for which we have no healing. He said, this is like that. Just stay as far away from this thing as you can. And, and he said, I, he said, if you would know what I had to crawl out of, he said, I was involved in something. It took me months to crawl out of where, what I was involved in. And I'm telling you, this is so much bigger than you just stay away from it so i thanked him and hung up now now i figured because i felt bad for her i don't want to just tell her that i'm too afraid to help her so i decided i'm going to call rabbi torsky 
Now, one time I was flying on an airplane with Rabbi Torsky. My father and I and a friend of ours, a few friends of ours, were, were flew to Pittsburgh with Rabbi Torsky as a birthday present for his brother, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Torsky. The, the Pittsburgh Jewish community had commissioned a, a rabbi, his brother, uh, the Rabbi Torsky, Rabbi Michal Torsky from Milwaukee, had written all sorts of songs and they had been arranged for a symphony. So they had gotten a Pittsburgh symphony to play Rabbi Torsky's songs at a concert for his brother as a birthday present. So several of us flew out with Rabbi Torsky and we went to Pittsburgh and went to the concert. We had lunch at a restaurant in Pittsburgh, a kosher restaurant in Pittsburgh, went to the, to the concert and now we're flying back. Right near that restaurant, there was a used bookstore. And in the used bookstore, I bought a book by Carlos Castanetis. And I'm sitting on the plane in the seat right next to Rabbi Tversky, reading my book by Carlos Castanetis. Why? I cannot explain that to you. But Rabbi Tversky looks over and he goes, what are you reading? And I start to tell him about the book by Carlos Castanetis. And then he tells me a story. He said, I once got a phone call from a medium uh, and she told me that my brother who had recently passed, I think it was Ramutal Tursky, his brother who recently passed, was trying to get in touch with him. She was like a medium from Indiana or something. Somehow she's calling him on the phone and she says, your brother wants to get in touch with you, expecting that she's going to you know, be the connection between Rabbi Tversky and his brother. Rabbi Tversky thanked her. He said, I thanked her very much and said, I'll, I, I won't be needing her services, but thank you very much. But, it's, but he said that he didn't, um, he didn't uh, completely ignore it. So he decided he's going to go to the cemetery where his brother's buried in Milwaukee. They have a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery where the Twer where the Tversky's are buried. And um, so he, he said, I went to his grave and I said, look, if you're trying to get in touch with me, you need to use a different method. Don't go <laughs> through mediums. If you want to talk to me, talk to me directly. So, I mean, there are other reasons why I thought I could talk to Rabbi Tversky about this, but that was one of the reasons I thought I could talk to Rabbi Tversky about this. But also, by the way, I didn't, this is one thing I wanted. I, part of the reason I called Rabbi Shane Garten, I, there were two reasons why I called Rabbi Shane Garten. He lived in New Jersey. I figured it's a couple hours for him to get to Long Island. And he could assess it because he's got street smarts and he's got the mystical stuff. So he could tell if this is really about an autistic child and autism, or is this, you know, something in a spiritual realm, he'd be able to make the distinction and he could work both sides of it, whatever it was. So that was why I called Rabbi Shane Garden. I did not expect that reaction. <laughs> so now I called Rabbi Tversky and be honest, I thought Rabbi Tversky would just not take, not feel this was serious. I thought he would just like, so I told the whole thing to Rabbi Tversky, and then there's like a pause, and Rabbi Tversky, and he says to me, "I don't, I don't actually know how to do anything here." But he said, "In is," and he said, "I don't know of anybody in America that knows how to handle these, but in Israel they do. There are people in Israel that know how to deal with this stuff. So she needs to find somebody she knows in Israel." and make contact with them and have them research somebody who knows how to do this and then they should do it. So I called her then after I had something to say to her. And then she called me back like a day or two later and said she, she had a cousin who lived in Beit, Vermont, Beit Shemesh or Beit Shemesh. And he said he found somebody. And so that's the way they're gonna go, that somebody in Israel is gonna handle it. And that, that was the end of it. But so, then she didn't I call you to tell you how it worked out. No, and honestly, I 
I never touched that blog after that. <laughs> <laughs> I never wrote another thing because I felt like I'm messing with things. I don't know what they are. And you don't want to make fun of things that you don't know what they are either. You just don't want to, you don't want to completely mess there. with it. Right. So although that wasn't an angel story, but it did have to do with what she called a Jewish demon. I, it has to be. So I'm assuming if it was something, it was a soul uh, demon, but I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about in the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. I had another uh, experience with demons, not angels, but there is a movie, Angels and Demons. That's the thread here. Uh, anyways. Yeah, I, there's another, I had another demon or earlier than this this demon uh, episode where I, I was in Israel, I was teaching at Orsameach and there, there was a guy there who I never presented myself as knowing the deep secrets of Judaism. It wasn't like I offered myself as a, somebody like that, but every once in a while, somebody would just, open up to me about something that was a mystical thing that was going on in their life. So this, this guy, uh, a young man tells me that his brother had like a bad meditation experience. It was like a bad trip, but it was a meditation experience. And his, and after that meditation experience, he's, he, he's, in constant fear he feels fear all the time he can't sleep with the lights out mm. he's just been in kind of dread and fear for several months and would i be open to talking to him? again why would this guy think that i would be able to do it i don't know but so he um he approached me about that and i said i'll i'll ask around but let me talk to him and I'll, I'll see if I can ask around and find, maybe I can help find somebody who could help. So um, he came and told me that he told me about the experience. And what he said was they were meditating on God's four letter name as it's written in the Torah. So, so I had a sheet of paper with God's four letter name as it's written in the Torah. And they're meant to focus on the four letter name for a while and then close their eyes and see it with their eyes closed and so he did that and immediately it became like huge and it had like stones it looked like the kotel it looked like the kotel but it was the four letter name huge like the kotel four letter name so in his vision he's he goes up to it to, to see what it feels like and his hand goes through it so he realizes there's something on the other side. So he goes through the God's four letter name that looks like the Kotel onto the other side. The other side is completely black, completely black, but he senses there's a light above, but it, but he can't see the light and he, he can't look up at the light. He can't see the light. And it's not that, in other words, it's completely black, but somehow he knows there's a light somewhere. And now he's just looking around and then he hears his voice go, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And then he gets frightened. He goes back to where he came and he wakes up. And ever since then, he has had fear. That is what he told me. Hmm. So I didn't, obviously, I don't know what, you know what to do, but I went to Ramosha Shapiro, bless him memory. I asked Ramosha Shapiro, what should, you know, could he meet with you? And Ramosha asked me if he speaks Hebrew. And I said, no. And then he said, he only speaks English. And Ramosha says, I don't think I'm the right person for this because I, I don't really speak English. He doesn't speak Hebrew. And this is not the kind of thing where you want a translator. But um, so, but he said to me, it's shading. It's demons. That's what he said to me, it's demons. You need to go to Rav Scheinberg. He needs to go to Rav Scheinberg. Now, Rav Scheinberg, honestly, of all the rabbinic figures in Israel, he was the last, 
person I would have thought of that somebody would say it's demons. He needs to go to Rav Scheinberg. And uh, Rav Scheinberg is he he was like considered one of the great sages, and you would go to him for halachic questions and stuff. But his manner was very straightforward, very simple, and uh, you just didn't think of him as somebody who somebody as deep as Ramosha Shapiro would say, you need to send him to Rav Scheinberg. So anyways, I, I go and I tell this guy, you, um, that Ramosha Shapiro said, you need to go to Rav Scheinberg. And I happened to, no, I, I used to go to talk to Rav Scheinberg um, every so often that he has hours every day, like in the afternoon, a couple hours where people just, sort of wait online to talk to him. And then in his apartment, like he's in his apartment, you knock on the door, you go into the apartment, there's people waiting. And when it's your turn, you just go up and talk, talk with them. So I, and I told the guy, I, I can't go with you today. I had something I had to do, but it's easy to go. He speaks English. You just go to his thing, knock on the door and you go take care of it. So he goes off, he comes back. I see him smiling. He said, it's over. It's out. It's done. And I asked him what ha what happened, and so um, he said, "I told Ruf Scheinberg the story," and then Ruf Scheinberg just patted me on the cheek and said, "Don't worry about it." Boom. Okay. It just left. But Ramosha had said to me, "You need to tell him," because he said, it's, "This is." demons this is shading and you need to tell him that he shouldn't meditate because he when he there's something about when he meditates that he the, the, he gets somehow sticky to demons mm. so he needs to uh to he shouldn't <laughs> meditate and i heard like a few months later his brother said he was off meditating again. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hopefully everything worked out with him okay but um yeah so uh and there so there are there are, there's a famous uh, story from the Kotzka Rebbe. The students of the Kotzka Rebbe asked the Kotzka Rebbe, what are they supposed to do about the Rambam? The Rambam said that there's no such thing as demons. There's that he, he didn't say this about angels, but he, he said it about demons. He said the Rambam said there's no such thing as demons. These are just the these are figments of people's imagination. They're used and abused by people that want to manipulate other people. And there's really no such thing as demons. So the Kotzka Rebbe's uh, uh, Hasidim asked him, what are we supposed to do about the fact that the Gemara makes it clear that there are demons? There's a lot of, a lot of demon Gemaras. And, and it talks about demons, how you see demons, all sorts of things like that. And so um, what do you... What are you supposed to do about that? The Gemara says there are demons. The Rambam says there's no such thing as demons. So the Kotzka Rebbe said, whenever a tzaddik decrees something, they fulfill it in heaven. So until the Rambam said what he said, there were demons. But now that the Rambam said there aren't demons, there aren't demons anymore. I don't know what to do about the various things, my various experiences, uh, but uh, often told at campfires, my it is my preference to tell these stories only at campfires if I can <laughs> at night, but I don't know how to fit that into the Kotzka Rebbe's uh, statement about the Rambam, but um, the there is a rationalist notion of angels, which the Rambam himself espouses. The Rambam doesn't suggest, the Rambam suggests that there are angels. After all, the, the Torah has stories about angels. But the Rambam says that, you know, that you, you cannot see an angel in your waking life. You can't see them in your waking life. Because they're spiritual entities, and spiritual entities are not subject to your senses. Your senses cannot detect a spiritual entity. Your senses are physical and react and respond 
to the physical world. So if there's a story about somebody seeing an angel, it is a prophecy. It is somebody's prophecy. Because you, and many times angels appear in prophecy. It's a device that God uses in making contact with man. And so a lot of times in prophecies, somebody will say, I saw an angel or angels, etc." They are, they, they, they are a truth, but they aren't a physical reality. They are a truth and they are, uh, they, they mean something in the spiritual world, but they are not a physical, a physical reality. This is according to the Rambam. So what do you do about the story of the three angels that come to visit Avram and Sarah? So the Rambam says that that's a prophecy. Avram is in the midst of prophecy. It actually starts that way. And God appeared to Avram. That's how it starts, by Yera. The Torah portion of Yera, and God appeared to Avram. And then it doesn't talk about what, what did God say? It didn't say anything there. It just says God appeared to Avram. And then suddenly there's these three men coming to visit, etc. So the Rambam says, that's how God appeared to Avram. In other words, there's a vision. In the vision, three people are coming to visit him. This is all part of Avram's vision. Now, but the Ramban, Nachmanides, who takes issue with this, he doesn't explain how. He says there is a secret to how we can physically interact with angels. And it's a Kabbalistic secret. So he seems to acknowledge the Rambam's problem, but just suggests that there's a Kabbalistic workaround, workaround that the Rambam doesn't know about because the Rambam doesn't have that Kabbalistic workaround. But he does. But so, so he argues. And one of the things he argues about is he says, what about the people of stone? They all saw angels. They all saw angels. Are they prophets? Does he think they're prophets? So to that, there were students of the Rambam who responded and said that that's still part of Avram's prophecy. That's still part of Avram's prophecy. Avram is seeing all that. He's being shown all that. They didn't see angels. The people didn't see angels. They may, obviously, they interacted with something, you know, something went on over there and Sodom was destroyed, but they, they don't, they didn't see angels. That's how it is shown to Avram. Something happened that is translated in a prophecy to they saw angels. And if you look at the text, text, there is textual support for the idea that Avram is potentially having a vision all the way through until, um, after the destruction of stone where Avram wakes up, it says he wakes up and he stands up and he looks out and he sees the smoke coming up over Sodom. So it actually fits the text. It fits the text. So um, the Ramam also says that our Bilam story is a prophecy. That any, again, there's two issues here. One issue is a talking donkey. The other issue is an angel. Believe it or not, it's the angel one that clinches the deal here. Because you cannot see angels unless you're in prophecy. Now, Bilam is a prophet. And again, if you look at the verses there, you could trace this. Like this, these, the, this opinion of the Rambam causes consternation amongst others, other scholars. But you can see why he's going there, because explain how it is that people's senses can sense a spiritual entity. We don't see the soul. Do you ever see a soul? You don't see a soul. I have watched several movies about ghosts. There's not a clear explanation about how that works, in, even in the movies. But we don't see a soul. The soul is the spiritual aspect of you. It is your spiritual self, the soul. I never see that. I never see that. You know why? Because it's not subject to the senses. That's why I sense it. There's some level of my being that recognizes it and can react and respond to it, but I don't see it. I don't hear it. It's your body that I'm hearing and seeing. It's not your soul, but I recognize your soul and I understand your soul. The, the, you know, what, what I'm connecting to is your soul. Uh, so that would be the same thing with an angel, the Rambam says. And therefore, he suggests that this thing is also a vision. Every time it comes up with, uh, every time there is a, a story with angels, where angels are interacting with a person, it is 
a vision. It is not happening in regular life. That is the Rambam's opinion. Are dreams visions? Right. So dreams are not prophecy necessarily, but it, it could be in something like a dream also, you could see see angels. It probably if you saw an angel in a dream and was talking to you, that would be prophecy. It would probably wouldn't, you know, if, if something like that happened, it probably would be prophecy. Although Daniel has visions where there are angels involved and the they make a big point of saying that those are not prophecy. They are inspired dreams, but they're not prophecy. And the book of Daniel is not in the book of prophets. It's in the book of writings. So I guess so. I guess you could have um, experiences with angels in, in dreams. Uh, as long as, again, you're not in, it's not a physical experience. They are, it, it's some kind of a, a symbol a spiritual symbol that you're interacting with. Um, again, obviously, uh, had I accepted to be talking with angels, I would know more. I'd be able to tell you more. Uh, but that's the Rambam, uh, the, the Rambam's approach to it. Again, all those experiences that I have suggest that th there is a potential to interact with spiritual entities or at least wise people who are much wiser than I am, and and not just wiser in spiritual matters, but also smarter when it comes to what could happen in the physical world than I am, because they were all much better trained in every anything physical than I was ever trained in. Uh, and they were okay with the notion that there is some kind of interaction that potentially could happen between spiritual entities. I will tell you, I will finish with one last story, which I tell on occasion, which so you probably heard it, but it's what I believe was my encounter with Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet, when you read about him in the book of Kings, is a particular type of character. He has a, he has a very he he comes forth in a very robust way in the Book of Kings. When you read about him in the Talmud, he has a a much different character. It, 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 it's a much different character. In the Talmud, he ends up visiting people, and you can have revelations of Elijah. You can have revelations of Elijah. There were there were um, you know all sorts of Hasidic stories about people who wanted to be able to have a revelation of Elijah. There's stories about people who learned with Elijah the prophet. Even in the Talmud, there's stories about people that learned with Elijah the prophet. So the so he reveals himself to people. There are all sorts of fascinating agadot, all sorts of fascinating kind of midrashim in the Talmud. Uh, with people having stories with Elijah and Hasidic stories about people having experiences with Elijah. So I'm going to tell you what I believe was my experience with Elijah. I get to believe it. It's what I experienced it. Uh, anyway, so the story is this. This was um, when I, we were living in Israel. I want to say... I don't remember. Oh, we were living in Nevaeh at the time. I know that. So, um, where? Where? which was a neighborhood in in Jerusalem, in north, north of Jerusalem, like a suburb, north of the suburb of Jerusalem. So, um, Zippy was pregnant and she was having contractions that worried her um, OBGYN. They worried they so he wanted her to be in the hospital and she was on this drip that was supposed to prevent an early birth she was in i think the seventh month maybe maybe even the eighth month it wasn't it wasn't 
ridiculous to think you could give birth at that time and the baby would still live, but still they were, they didn't want it. Um, and so she was on this drip for a couple of weeks. Then she went home. Then she, then they sent her back in and she was in for another couple of weeks in the hospital. Now this hospital was a relatively new hospital. The, uh, the older hospitals in Israel all had a lot of character, a lot of character, and especially religious character. Because even if the hospital staff themselves weren't religious, but a lot of the people that were using these hospitals were religious. So if you were in these hospitals and you needed to be there for Shabbos, there were people having minyanim, they had cholent, you know, they had, you know, they had, there was a kind of Hamisha option yeah. in every, in every one of these hospitals except for this one, this <laughs> hospital, it was essentially just for women who were giving birth. And it, from, not only were the doctors not religious, but the whole hospital had no religious character to it at all. And so it's a Friday and I'm visiting Tippy, and she starts having contractions and they can't stop the contractions. And I can tell on the face of the nurses and the doctors that they are nervous. They're nervous. So um, it becomes clear I'm not going home. I thought I was going to visit and then go home. I have kids at home. I had a couple kids at home. I have to call the neighbors. They'll take care of the kids. They'll watch the kids. And I'm staying at the hospital. So, and now I'm in like this weird kind of eerie space. Like I'm like everything is sort of this gray and black, you know, tunnel vision kind of, if it was a camera, you'd have that kind of view of things. And um, so like they, uh, I'm, they've now moved her from the room she was in to a room right near the labor room because they're ready for her. At some point, she's going to give birth. Whose child was this? This was a child that did not survive. So um, so it's now it's Friday night. It is dark outside. I'm inside. This is all going on. And, and suddenly, I feel somebody tapping me on my shoulder. And I turn around, and it's a Hasidic guy in full Hasidic garb. He's actually not Hasidic, I find out. There, there's a group called Erloi. They're Hungarian, but they they dress entirely Hasidish. They seem Hasidish. Um, anyway, so he's in a strimal. He's wearing complete Hasidish garb, and it's completely out of character for that place that this guy's there. And he says, "Come with me for Friday night for dinner. I want you to come to my house for dinner." And I did not want to be bothered. This was annoying to me because I'm in this place and I don't want to be bothered by anybody. And so I turn around and I just, and then he taps on my thing again. He says, come with me. And I said, I can't come with you. My wife is, a, is about to give birth over here and I'm concerned about it. So then he talks to the doctors and he says, does he need to be here right now? And they said, nothing's going to happen probably for a couple of hours. He doesn't need to be here right now. So he goes, come on with me. So at that point, I just go with him and I'm following him. And in my, you know, I'm, it's like down these hallways, you know, down different things. And I'm following this guy outside the hospital. And then we walk like a few buildings away and the door opens to this ground floor apartment and it is gorgeous. Everything about it is gorgeous. And it just feels like warm and you know, lit, you know, warmly lit, warm, everything just looks perfect. The Shabbos table is royal. His family are waiting there. Like they've been waiting for me to come and I come and then I, I uh, they sit me at the table. They make, you know, they do Shalom Aleichem. And I told him I can't stay. And he goes, I promise you, we will finish the meal in half an hour. And, and so he, he, they made, they did Shalom Aleichem. They make kiddish, the you know we washed, we had challah, we had, and there was somebody pouring, a dr you know drinks for me, and making sure my plate had food on it, etc. They're like watching me, and 
half an hour came, they finished and benched, and I was out of there. And it wasn't like they just said goodbye to me after half an hour. The whole family benched at half an hour. And mm-hmm. then then he like took me out, took me back to what was going on. In I when I look back at that moment, because it was such a dark moment. It was such a dark experience before and after it got dark, but that was like light. And I would not be able to pick this guy out. I guarantee you, if I, if I found people that lived in that neighborhood around that time, they would tell me who he was. Cause I'm sure he did this every week on Shabbos. But I tell you without a doubt to me, that was Eliel Hoanabi. <laughs> and that is that I look forward to learning more with you guys next week as we explore other topics besides angels and demons until then.